again, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of In Conversation. And uh, I'm delighted to say on this episode, we've got the Catalan Dragons own enforcer himself, Mr. Mike McMeekin. Mike, good day to you. How are we? Very, very you, well, man. sir. Very, very well. Delighted to have you on. Uh, so we're going to be going through uh, Mike's career uh, in as much detail as we can in a short space of time. But as we do here on In Conversation, we're going to settle Mike in. We're going to make him a little bit more relaxed. So, Mike, first things first, what's your favourite film? Um, oh, God. Start off pretty tough then. Um, what would it be? Probably something like Saving Private Ryan, I would think. Saving Private Ryan. Favourite song? Yeah. Favorite song. Uh, uh, ba, ba, ba. I don't know yeah. that. One. No, no, that's a tough one. Uh, I'll go with uh, Queen. We will rock you just because it's my daughter's favorite song at the moment. Solid choice. What's your box set at the minute? What are you watching on the telly? Um, I've just started. Well, halfway through the uh, rugby documentary on Netflix about the Six Nations. Yeah, yeah. Um, found that pretty good. Um, and then I'm also into Pearson. I don't okay. know if you've heard of that. It's, it's nope. a spin-off from the Suits, uh, the Suits series. Right. Sorry. Super. Uh, can you hear that? My uh, my washing machine sounds like it's taken off. Uh, no, um, we can't. Oh, I can't. Okay, so, good. No. Good, good. There you go. A modern oh, man. Mike's, Mike's doing his, mo his washing while he's doing this. <laughs> Multitasking. Fantastic. Right. Uh, let's uh, let's get a bit French. Snails or frog legs? Um, I'll go with snails only because that's the only thing I've tried. I've not tried a frog leg yet. Fair enough. Cronenborg or a French red wine? Oh, I'll go red wine. Yeah. That's yeah. One. Okay. What's your favourite away ground to go to in Super League? Um, uh, uh, I'd say, yeah, I'd say Wigan. Uh, it's always a pretty good atmosphere. Fair enough. And the pitch itself is really good as well. That'll uh, make me pay eating for followers happy. It's the first time <laughs> Wigan's been mentioned. Bless them. Um, right. Who's got the worst dress sense in the dressing room at Catalan? <laughs> worst dress sense? Uh, do, 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 do. I'm going to say Romain Navarrete because he comes out with some fruity stuff. <laughs> Who's the biggest joker in the dressing room? Practical joker. Uh, well, you've got English humour with Tom Davis and then the Arich Costa is also like a bit of a jokester but a bit different to English humour so he's, he's not the French version but then you've got Tom on the English version. Fair play. Uh, when you come over to the UK, do you do you have a roommate? And if you do, who is it? Yeah, uh, Tom Johnston is my roommate. We, Had a great uh, year last year, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Yeah, solid. He'll be looking, hopefully, to do the same again. Uh, great stuff. Right, who is your rugby league hero? Uh, rugby league hero? Uh, it's a difficult one, really, because I always grew up just watching rugby union. Yeah. Um, you know, so... Probably someone like uh, Andy Farrell, I'd say, or Jason Robinson, just because, like I say, I, I watched Union, so it kind of swapped over into that. Fair and enough. And, you know, they, they were pretty good at both, weren't they? So. Well, two two legends of, of, of both yeah. codes, aren't they? Let's be, let's be fair. Yeah. Right, who's the hardest player you faced in Super League? In Super League, oh, I suppose not faced. Or internationally, um, who you come up against? There's been a there's been a few. Probably the hardest hardest hitting is Thomas Lulua. Right. Um, you know, you probably think half backs you don't you know uh half of the word, but you don't really think of them with big hitters, but you know, you run at him and you know about it. Him and I think got rocked once by Palliacina as well. So, you know, got them to so both pretty solid. Who's the best player that you've played alongside in your career today? Um, yeah, Sam Tompkins. Um, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Some try that in the semi last year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Some try. Outstanding. Yeah. It was a shame we couldn't really finish it off for him, but... Yeah. yeah well, we'll, we'll get something. to that. We'll get to that later. <laughs> awesome. um, of Of the hundreds that you've scored, what's your favourite try that you've scored? Oh, uh, favourite try. 
Um, probably the one in the grand final against Saints again in twenty one, yeah. just because yeah. of the obviously we lost it, but okay. the, the, where it was where it was forward at, and you know I'm a, I'm a big United fan as well, so it was pretty cool to score Old Trafford. Spot on. And finally, in this section, if you had three dinner party guests that you could invite to your home, alive or dead, yeah. uh, who would those three dinner party guests be and why? Uh, I think uh, Ramesh Ranganathan for his uh, comedian comedy value. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I might just go with people like Jack Whitehall as well. I'm a big fan of his, his uh, thing. And um, uh, maybe like Toby Bryant. Yeah, or... yeah. Uh, just because of you know he's an absolute legend of his sport and yeah. the mentality that he had and you know being able to learn from even just small things from him would be pretty cool. Fair enough. Sounds like a, a decent dinner party that one. Yeah. Right. yeah. So my been making born nineteen ninety four. That makes me feel a little bit old. Um, obviously in Basingstoke, West Side of London. There, you've already mentioned that really you grew up really rugby union. So just walk us through the transition. You know. What brought you to rugby league uh, in, in in its in, in your infancy? Uh, well, my family originate from up in Nantwich, uh, Cheshire Way. Anyway, so I was my family are from up north, but so they my parents and that grew up rugby union, rugby league as well. Like my dad's granddad was a big rugby league fan. Um, he was a big Saints fan, actually. So he was I'm guessing my dad got it from him. And then we, with dad's work, we were down south. So originally, obviously, to, to start off with, you play union down there. I think yeah. that's where I got that part from. And then I think, I don't know how old I was. I think I was about 10 or 11. My brother was playing for, he got picked up from London Broncos Reserve. Because he went quite high in the rugby union part, and he was in the England uh, youth selection for rugby union, and then he just got to a point where he wanted to try like league, so he, he went got into the academy at London Broncos, and he noticed there was like an amateur side training at the same time where he was at um, I think it was Brunel University, so just went over and saw what age it was. I think it was under thirteen, so I'm maybe two three years below, but just went down there and. I think it was a Wednesday evening and then yeah, just kind of it wasn't anything too structured. It was just go long, play a bit of kick tennis, I think it was, a bit of touch, and and then it was like kind of just games really, and then I kind of had a real good I, I'd been watching it when I was younger anyway. Like I was I used to watch the grand finals of Bradford and St. Helens and all that. So I was aware of rugby league. I wasn't going into it like blind. I knew I knew about rugby league, but I didn't know there was any teams around there. So to be just I just went over there and, and then enjoyed it and luckily it worked out where I didn't have to give up union straight away and I could play both union and league so I played union in the in the winter and then rugby league was in the summer but at that point when I joined it was maybe five or six league teams in London so you're talking you know hardly any games in the season so it was more just training and having fun so it, it, it was it was good at that point. I was using it more as keeping fit for my rugby union, and then you know I just got to probably about fifteen, where I was then in a situation where I kind of had to choose. What made you choose league then, right? Uh, it was it was difficult, really. Um, obviously, I had a love for both of them. I kind of just enjoyed the the speed of the league. I was playing centre in, in Union and I felt like I wasn't really getting any ball or I wasn't being used. So I was just found myself just standing there and, you know, it, it was difficult because when you're in a team, sometimes it's, it's hard at that age in rugby union to utilise everyone in the team. So I was getting moved about, I was getting moved into the forwards and the centres to get the ball a bit. So, And I just found like the, the flowing game of rugby league just exciting. Um, um, and then I had trials with like union counties and stuff, but didn't really work out. 
Um, so I'm just stuck with league and then kind of just kept on developing from there. I kept on investing all my time into league rather than union. So how did so uh, we we be training so close to the Broncos? Is that yeah. how is that how you were picked up by the Broncos, or was it? Uh, you, no, so we kind happen? of had yeah. So that was back in London. They have um, like regional camps. And I'm not sure how it works in in. I think it's pretty similar to what they have in like the Northwest and Yorkshire and stuff. There, yeah, like yeah. trial like camps, the Northwest stuff. counties, uh, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we obviously with London, it's not as big as Yorkshire in terms of teams. You've got different divisions in amateur league and in yeah. up in those regions. So for us, it was North versus South London, but it was pretty much just like one team versus the other, and and then London would pick like I think it was about twelve players or something to go into the structure of the academy. A scholarship, as, as what they call it, um, and then that was from the age of under thirteen that I got picked up from there, and then just went up from there, and then we'd have after every year from under fourteens, under fifteens, I think as well, we'd have like the I can't remember what they're called, but like where we would play, so we'd be called London the South, which was just London Broncos pretty much, and we'd play against Yorkshire, Northwest, and then Cumbria. So I think we had one. The big under fourteens went up there, and then that was where like the England youth team was formed. I think the first yeah. year I didn't I didn't get picked for it, um, and then I just went went back and you know I just just had to work a lot on myself really, like on my game, and I just realised that I had a lot to do to get to the next phase. And I think we went back the year after, and I got in so. Superb, superb. So obviously London, your first professional club, uh, London yeah. Broncos, of course. Um, I think you 2012 you started at, at London Broncos. Is that right, yeah, right? yeah. About 2012, yeah, your yeah, debut yeah. was that year. Uh, yeah. You came, I think it was around, I think it's around maybe around 25, 26 ish of that season. Yeah, your yeah. debut against Warrington, and it was the game that Warrington played before the cha uh, the Challenge Cup final against Leeds, and I think, yeah. but they didn't pick a. They didn't pick a, a weakened squad that day. Uh, you lost 62 18. Sorry to remind you of that. It wasn't getting half time, though. It was 24 18. You were putting a scare on him, if, if you remember. But no, you, we won a, that game. We won that game. Oh, so yes. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, yeah. So, in terms of, I, I had that down as Warrington 62 18. It was the other way around, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, but yeah, that day, front row, you're coming up against um, Adrian mm. Morley, Paul yeah. Wood. Chris Hill, Trent Waterhouse, Mike Cooper, Dancing David Solomona. Yeah. How old were you when that? Uh, just turned thing? 18. Yeah. Just turned 18? Yeah, yeah. Right, so an 18-year-old Mike McMeekin yeah. is selected for that London Bronco side coming up against those yeah. players. Baptism of fire, walk us through your debut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was... I had all the, all the emotions, really. It was, it was pretty crazy. Uh, I just remember... I'd just finished college, really, probably a, a few months before that, so I started training full-time. Then didn't really think anything of it. I was just didn't think I was going to be making my debut anytime soon. And then I think Tone Club pulled out with a groin on the team run the day before. I'd been tipped up saying, oh, look, club is a bit hit and miss. And the coach wants to use you if he's not fit. I was like, well, all right, okay. <laughs> Um, and then yeah, he pulled out the day before, and I was like, okay, all right, we'll see how this goes then. And then came to the game day, and then like I say, we just kind of it was a bit of a. And looking back now, you kind of can see how it did blow out a bit for Warrington. You know, they've got the, the grand yeah. final, the the yeah, final it. the week after. Yeah. Although their their squad was, like I said, pretty stacked with international players. You always have kind of one eye on the week after, and you want to just get through that game, uh, injury free. But yeah, it, it, was, it was an awesome, awesome experience, and one that I remember fondly from the moment that I stepped on. Like, I think it was six minutes before half time, I got my, my first touch, and then from there, I was just in a washing machine. I was just that was the hardest six minutes I've ever played in my career. <laughs> I remember I was doing because I'd not played in the middle at that point, I was. I was playing back growing in, in academy and reserves and stuff. So I was just like 
no, I've not played in there before. And then you, you suddenly realise you're making third man tackles all the time and having to sprint back. And just how quick the game is compared to academy level, it's it's pretty pretty different. But yeah, it was, it was awesome. We had Chris Hill uh, on our last in conversation, and his debut was against Saints. And uh, he talked yeah. about his first proper hit was Nick Fozard, who who picked him out. And he said after you know the stars and all the rest of it, he said it was a. a can you remember who gave you your first big hit? Uh, yeah, I remember. I think I can't remember if it was. Gaz Ellis or like it's a Palliacina. I remember. I think it might have been Palliacina because I it was against Hull FC and I remember I got uh, a drop off. I went back and he just caught me. I just felt my legs go up. <laughs> and then I was just like, yeah, that's uh And then I think I remember reading it in the in the paper in the League Express. Somebody was saying like big hit, big hit of the week, and it was his on me. I was like, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> it's your way around though now. And now, now you're getting oh, your yeah. own back. Now you're getting sometimes, your own back. Sometimes. <laughs> so, um, again, when we had Chris on, uh, Chris spoke in glowing terms about, and, and Joe Philbin did as well, uh, you know, dropping down a league uh, in your in, in your youth to get some experience. And I think mm. you, you had Scholars, didn't you? Didn't you do a bit of time at the yeah, Scholars? Yeah, I, I had a couple of games at Scholars and then a few games at Emmel as well. Yeah. Stags, yeah. How important was that for your development? Yeah, it was good. Um, I think it's, I think probably it's underestimated for young players at times. At the time, you probably may be thinking, you know, because I was at London in 2014 when I got sent there. And we had a pretty young team. It was probably an average age of like 21, 22, because we were just, it was a situation where the finances or something like that, it was, they weren't sure where they were going to go at the beginning of 2014. So by the time the club was actually secured, it was too late to sign big play like big name players and stuff. So we had to invest pretty uh, young. And looking back now, it was it was it was a very big important step for me to go and play them games. It was it meant I could play, it could build up my confidence because uh, we were getting battered fifty points to nil yeah, most yeah. games. Yeah. So the confidence takes a whack and it enabled me to like go down there and work on things that I need to work on. Um, I think yeah, I think it's definitely something you take for granted at the time. Because some people get sent there and they're a bit, you know, a bit annoyed. You know, they want to be playing each week. But you don't realise how important playing in them games can be. Um, and Big message. You're also still you're still playing with very, very good players, even in the championship. You know, I think people take that for granted. They're still great players in the championship. They just prefer to be part time. Even more so now, you know, the likes of yeah. Myler and Widdop and the likes going into exactly, yeah. championship rugby. So I think that's a great message for any young up and coming rugby league player. You know, Mike there saying, you know, just embrace it, go learn yeah. your craft, come back a better player. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Super. I think those few games that I played down there were massive to my career. Superb. Uh, in terms of, I think your first try was against Salford. If my research is right. Was that yeah. right? At the high? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. That must have been a good moment. Yeah. 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 Uh, unfortunately, again, we got beat pretty heavy, but I think it was one of the last plays of the game. I think we kicked off again because we've been scored against again. But uh, I think we got a tip back or something, or it bounced, I think, in the middle of the pitch and one of the boys caught it, passed it to me and then just kind of dove over. I was like, oh, pretty, pretty good. I remember it, it was a pretty special one because... I think the year before, I nearly had an opportunity to score against Saints, and then I just I mucked it up. I just knocked it on. I was like, ah, oh, that would have been pretty cool to score there. But you know, you always remember your first tries in in Super League. It was it was nice to get one because I didn't get many after that. To be fair though, to you, Matt, you know you, you're a big you know you you are a big unit, uh, and for the reason now why you're playing playing front row. Uh, for for Catalan, but you've always had a you've always had good feet, haven't you? You, you? You've got a bit of pace about you as well, haven't you? Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, I'll take the bit of pace. Um, no, you have for, for you know for for a big big forward. You know you, you have got you have got a bit of pace in you, haven't you? Yeah, well, I started probably around. I think I started about centre. That's when I played yeah. when I was playing amateur and in, in the academy. So slowly made my way in. Um, but I think you know it's it's kind of the way the modern game's going. Anyway, you've you, you've probably 
15, 20 years ago, you'd say front row, you'd stick players who were slow and unfit in the front row or just big units, you know what I mean? Yeah. So now you look at front rows across the league and everyone's in shape and everyone's quick. They've got a yeah. bit of footwork about them. You've, you've got, you know, your, your traditional front row's not there anymore. It's the game's yeah. too quick for that. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you've got the opportunity to go back to your former club. Uh, as we're recording this, Mike's uh, just off the back of round number two and a win at, at yeah. London. A couple of things here. One, to go back to your own club, your old club, uh, for them to have generated best part of five and a half thousand fans, which was brilliant. Yeah. And they were very vocal as well. They kept going right to the end, which, you know, to the, to their absolute credit, you know, they didn't, I think they finished in a, in an attacking phase, as, as if my memory serves me right from the weekend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, talk to me. I mean, from your perspective, London must hold a, a, a fond place in your heart because it started your, your professional career. But you know, talk to me about London now back in Super League. What was it like going back at the weekend? Um, you know, explain uh, what what your thoughts were going back. Yeah, um, I think it'd been about ten years since I'd last um, been around that area because we stayed in Kingston. Yeah, and that was where. We we had players' houses in Kingston, or just around the corner from Kingston in 2012. So it was around just over 10 years where, where I used to live in Kingston. Um, and like you say, it was, it was pretty fun memories to go back there. And although the majority of the club and the squad, backroom staff have moved on, there's still like a few players and backroom staff that's still there from when I was there. So it was good to see them. And... Um, you know, like you like you say, to to, to get five thousand fans in there is a big probably underestimated how good of an achievement that is for them. Um before I don't know what the average was, but when I was there it was just over a thousand fans would come to games. So I hope I hope they can keep that going. Um yeah. was, you know, people need to see what exciting game rugby league is in London. Uh, yeah. you can see People in London want to see exciting game, exciting sports. You see when like the hundred and crickets down in London, you get thousands of fans in. So, and I think they got they got good people in there. This John Keys who works in down in London, he's he's a massive part of what happens in the back in the back of the London. So he, he's he's massive for them. Um, but to see him up in Super League as well, which is is pretty good. Um, I like, I'm glad that they've they've been given an opportunity to get up there and, and one that's thoroughly deserved really I think one that's been looked people have said you know, they deserve to be in there I think yes definitely because you know they, they did what you're supposed to do in the championship you're, you're meant to win the championship to get into Super League and yeah. they did it in two of the toughest places to go last year they went firstly to Fevs to beat them who were favourites to go up and then to then go away to France to Toulouse to win there, you know what? Why why shouldn't they be in Super League now? Because they've literally done it that tough way. Um, so I, I'm excited to see what they can do this year, and hopefully they can shock a few people. Hopefully not against us. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it's a shame that uh, it's a shame a couple of uh, you know a couple of their players aren't going to be uh, there. I mean, Layla, Billy, Layla, it's such a shame. I was really looking yeah, forward yeah. to seeing Bill Leyland this season. You know, in in I think you know in half back, I think James Meadows is a is a player that could go really yeah. well this year. Only Leyland, I mean, he's only he's only a small lad, but you know, I I've been really impressed with his first two outings. Ollie Leyland, yeah. uh, did you find him a bit of a handful on on the weekend? Yeah, I think not just him, but I think there was a few few of them that really caused a few troubles. Um, uh, you got the likes of uh, Hakeem Maloudi, who's yeah. you know, he's, he's always somewhere, isn't he? He's always trying to force an offload. Um, and then you've got um, Robbie Story, who plays centre for them. Centre, yeah. I know from from Cass. And they got they got they got some players who can cause uh, a lot of threats. Really, uh, I think it took a pretty professional performance from us to to make sure that we got the win. Really, because. If people can take them for granted when you go down there, you're thinking, oh, they've just come up from championship or would we'll definitely win this game. But, you know, they're a team that if you don't want to be at your 100%, they'll shock you and they'll come after you. So 
we had to make sure we were on definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if nothing else, after two rounds, they've probably scored one of the uh, one of the best tries in the first two rounds. The story, won it. Yeah, Saints. Yeah, that good was, try, wasn't it? Would, it? Yeah, definitely. I think it just sums up their attitude, and you know, that they're willing to go the whole full eighty, regardless yeah. of the score. They'll they'll keep coming at you. And like you said, they, they scored that try, and then against us, they finished the game in an attacking position. Yeah, most you could be, you could argue, most teams would probably be like, oh, let's just throw in the towel, let's just chuck in some players who haven't had much game time and let's get them out there. But, you know, they kept coming at us and good on them, really. Absolutely. And, you know, Mike Eccles deserves loads of praise. One, for how he, he, he galvanised yeah. their season last season. Yeah. But I did a news update yesterday and uh, obviously the, the two coaches, Steve McNamara and Mike Eccles, spoke after the game. And you know what? I see a lot of, a lot of similarities in the way those two talk very composed, very calm, very you know, really yeah. well thought out the way they, they handle the press. I think Mike Eccles uh, is, is one to watch this year in terms of his development as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was head S&C when I was down at London, so to see him come from there. And I've always got along with Eccles. I've always respected his work that he did in the gym and you know, the, the way that he can get people fit and strong for the season. Yeah, I've always liked him and he, he gets people and it, it must be, I don't know exactly, but he must be getting people wanting to play for him. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's probably, as you can see in his press conferences, is that he's, the way that he speaks to people is with respect and yeah. wants people to play for him. And and they've also got some good good coaches as well with uh, Ryan Sheridan. Uh, I think I think he'll be very good for them as well. Yeah, well, we'll keep an eye on we'll keep an eye on London, and uh, like I say, you played a massive part in in your professional life. Right, you then go to Castleford in in 2015. Yeah. Talk about projects. Mike McMeekin likes a project. Uh, at the time, Castleford were on an, on an upward trajectory uh, that that pretty much um, landed in the 2017 season, um, where obviously we've already mentioned it, uh, Castleford go up against St. Helens in a, in a semi-final at the Jungle, 23-22, Luke Gale that night getting the all-important drop goal. Is that one of your fondest memories of Castleford, that, that game at the Jungle? It sounded incredible on the TV. It was a cracking game of rugby league yeah. to win it in that fashion as well, to go to the grand final. What's your memories of that night? Yeah. Um, the, fond of the memories was that we nearly threw the game away, which was what... <laughs> would have been pretty annoying I'll be honest um yeah that was something else this the I remember going out for warm up and how packed out the jungle was um it was we could a few weeks before that we had the league leaders and that was an incredible atmosphere as well because that was against wakey that was a, a local derby as well so yeah. that was that atmosphere was I didn't think it'd get beaten but then Come out for that semi final in the warm up. It was just starting to get full. Then we came out for the kickoff and it was absolutely packed. Obviously, you got Saints who travel well with their fans anyway. Yeah. And then our fans were just, you know, back to the rafters. And it was, it was such a good evening. And I'm so glad that we got the win, really. Um, it was, oh, just, yeah, yeah, it was a good, good game to be a part of. And that drop goal was something else. Yeah. It was a class. I mean, it's interesting in terms of, you know, th this part of your life and the fact that, you know, you've come up against teams uh, in your grand final career that have been, well, I mean, th that particular year you went up against uh, the Leeds Rhinos, wasn't it? It was the yeah. Danny Maguire final, as I recall, where he got the, the Harry Sunderland. Yeah. Um, and that was the end of that. That was the end of their era, really. They still had quality players, you know, but that, that was the, the, the last grand final that, that, that Leeds, that Leeds won. Um, you'd have played them under you know Simfield still around as well uh, as well. How yeah. good a side was that? And and that particular grand final, you, you know, your first one that you were walking out at, yeah, bad result for you. But what are your memories of that final against Leeds? Um, well, yeah, I think we had it was a bit mixed emotions really. I think we had all the stuff leading up to the grand final with Zach Hardacre in terms yeah. of. All that, so that kind of put a dampener on it, really. Like, kind of just a bit of a sour taste. It was a bit like, you know, okay, what do we do now? Um, we've 
been playing great rugby all year. Pretty much been the best league team in the league by far. You know, we've we've already put sixty points on Leeds. So looking back, we were probably pretty probably pretty arrogant uh, right. about it. You know, we were probably thinking, oh, we can still win. You know, we can still still play the same way that we want to. You know, even with without Zach. Um, and actually, we were talking about it the other day. Um, I was speaking to a few people. They were saying, oh, would you still have won if you had Zach playing? And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, probably. And hmm. they went, uh, they went, um, I don't know, because the way that we played wouldn't have probably matched the style that you need to have at a grand final. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, you probably, you might be right, actually, because now I've played in two grand finals. After that, you know, you can't, you look and you think, oh, yeah, this is actually the style that you need to play. You need to play the long game. You don't need to, it's not, you, when do you ever watch a grand final and you're thinking it's the most prettiest game you've seen or, you know, scored some sensational tries? I think there have been yeah. very, very good tries scored in grand finals, but you look at the way the game's played. It's, you know, you take, you, you hit ups, you move the ball about a bit, but it's, it's always wet, isn't it, in October? Yeah. So you finish them in corners and you just play the long game. So yeah, I was, and that's got me thinking. I was like, oh yeah, you know, maybe we did need to we needed to change the way that we played um, to win the game. And uh, looking back at that grand final in 2017, you know, we just kind of we just didn't turn up. Players yeah. didn't turn up. We just yeah. we had too many players on off games, and myself included, I, I, I was off. I wasn't I wasn't there at the races. So you, know, you can't expect to go against the team with leads with players like Danny Maguire, yeah. Rob Burrow. Ryan Hall, who have all been there and won the games. To turn them over at Old Trafford, you have to come up with your A game. You have to be 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10 to win that game. And Dan McGuire just kicked it to death. He just yeah. got the ball whenever he wanted and just picked his turn it around, said, you get out of there. And that's, that's what you've got to do in it in the grand final. And yeah. no matter how many points you win by, it's, you've just got to win it. Yeah. Um, I think the thing there is, I mean, you said arrogance, maybe naivety, because you know. Yeah, yeah, probably arrogance, so. probably a strong, probably yeah, a probably strong naivety, arrogance, yeah, probably naivety, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, probably just like, yeah, I wouldn't say arrogant. Yeah, I'd put that back in terms of you know, we we definitely knew we were in for a test. Yeah. Um, but probably maybe just a bit overconfident in in thinking you know we we can definitely beat this team. But, you know, you had to turn up and play, which we didn't. No, but it was still a brilliant season uh, for those Casford Tigers yeah. fans. Oh, you know, incredible yeah, yeah. season. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's funny, like some boys. Uh, I think it was like uh, I can't remember who said, but like they were saying in twenty seventeen, the way that we celebrated the league leaders. But I was like, yeah, when you're there, you know, it it, it was special. It was special for yeah. the club. It was special for the fans. It, it's not been done by the club before, so. For us to celebrate like that, it was, I think it was, you know, something that we we wanted to do because it was a special achievement. The way that we played that year was was pretty good. Unfortunately, we couldn't go make it even better by winning the grand final. But yeah, I look back on that year in fond memory still. That's an important point that you raised there. This is something that I've said over beers with my mates over many years around rugby league. To be the most consistent side over twenty seven rounds of rugby league. Do we give enough credit to the league leader show winners in this country? Yeah, no, no, definitely not. I don't think so. Um, it's it's not celebrated enough. No, definitely not. Um, we didn't do it really when we, you know, that when we won it here here in 2021, because we we had in mind that we wanted to go to the grand final and win that. Yeah. So we didn't really celebrate it that much. I think obviously it was. A big day for the club because it was the first that trophy since the Challenge Cup, and it was the first time they've won the league leaders. So we knew we had players in our team who had won the league leaders before and been like the you know it's it's not that big, but you know looking at it, it should be because yeah. like, yeah. you are the best team throughout the whole year. You look exactly. at Premiership football, you know you win you win the Premier League from being the best team all year round. Yeah, no, I'm I, I, absolutely. I know when. And Warrington won it. Um, you know, it's a hell of an achievement, you know, to go for a mm. season and come out top of the ladder. I mean, Leeds, we mentioned Leeds, Leeds made Leeds made uh, a history of, of finishing not top but but winning the grand final. But uh, but like yeah. I say, I think Casper deserved to celebrate that because at the start of the season, 
you know, very much in the spirit of the league last year with the uh, Challenge Cup and what they achieved. Nobody, nobody had Castleford uh, that season as going to the grand final and achieving the league no. leaders. No, nobody had them down for that. So no. it was only right and proper for me that the players and the supporters took a moment that night to celebrate it. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, and I think it was like I said to you before, it was it was an awesome atmosphere as well at the ground that night, and we knew we were going to get the league leaders that night. So it was a, a local derby, and we managed to sell out the ground as well. So it was yeah. special. It was special to be a part of. Spot on. And you know, as much as it didn't end the way you'd have wanted it to on the mm. field uh, for Castleford. This was a this for me was a, a big year for for Mike McMeekin. Uh, you know, internationally, uh, you know, you picked for England in uh, in the May uh, for Samoa. Yeah. Uh, I think you came off the bench in that one. If I'm right. Um, uh, no, I started that one. Did you yeah. Start that one. Did you start yeah, that one? yeah. My apologies. I thought you came off the bench yeah. on that. Um, but yeah, you, you you played against Samoa in the mid season, and then of course 2017, you go off to the World Cup as well mm. as getting in the dream team. So that's how well Mike McMeekin played in 2017. So this this is a this is a huge year for you because you've achieved something at Castleford. On a personal note, you're in the dream team, which again should be celebrated. And now you're walking out in the World Cup um for your country. So yeah. talk to me about that international debut against Samoa, but then it goes up a level. I spoke to Paul Rowley about this in terms of you know, he was World Cup against Australia and he talked about that. It's a completely yeah. different thing. So your debut your debut first, what that meant to you, but then walking out as an England international at a World Cup in 2017, what, what was that yeah. like for Mike McMeek? Yeah, so I remember back, it was back in it was the mid-season test, wasn't it, in, in May um, against Samoa. So I remember being part of the England squad like the build up to it and they were saying look you'll get your phone calls a week before we leave or two weeks before we leave I remember seeing my phone ring and it was uh, JP and he was saying look you've been you've been selected and I was like oh wow no way um, he was like yeah just congratulations and we'll send you for all the details but you know for now just enjoy the moment so first thing first I called my missus and I was like look I've been selected so um we go away for a week to Australia. So I was like, God, this is unbelievable, really. It's pretty exciting. I was a bit excited, nervous. Never really, I didn't really know any of the players about from Zap and Gailey from Gas. So we went, flew over, for, flew in business class. I was like, oh, wow, this is something else. Um, but then when we got there, it just felt, like another another level up really it was you get treated unbelievably well. We went and stayed at Fuji Beach. It was right the hotel right on the beach in Fuji and us in Sydney. So we're in an awesome spot. All the facilities that we used were top quality and it was a pretty relaxed week really that one. Um we had Wayne Bennett as coach and he, he knew that we'd been training with our clubs anyway. We had the jet lag so we just pretty chilled. One Two training sessions, maybe max, and then away we go. Played against Samoa, and I remember because my brother lives in New Zealand, so he managed to get across to the game. So that was pretty special to be able to have have him over there because being my debut as well, he was he, he'd been there through most of my career. So then for him to see my debut for England was pretty cool. Um, and I remember the game being I was saying to you about the speed of Super League and then it just went up another 10 notches from from Super League and I remember just how quick it was and James Graham just comes up to me and says look you know it's quick but don't worry like your second wind will come <laughs> I was thinking for, for now it, I'm, I'm still waiting for that second wind coming <laughs> I mean you're yeah. I mean you're in a privileged position here Mike because to have been coached by the great, and he and he is the great Wayne Bennett, isn't he? Mm. He's the great. Um, mm. Talk to me about Wayne Bennett. What's he like yeah. as a coach? What in that period of time? How did he impact your career? Well, I thought he's it's all about like the boys, and that he always wants the the team to be happy. So whether it was what we needed on the pitch, off the pitch, whatever, really, just made sure it had it. 
and it, it just it's good to get like just another coach's views on things like everyone's it different every coach is different like they've all, all got the different ways of how they want to play and it, it's just someone that when he speaks you listen like yeah regardless of what he's talking about he's he's always he's been there he's won it all so whatever he had to say I always made sure that I could take something from it and it's me being pretty young at that point it was it was a massive part of my development as a player as well it's not a medal but you can always say you played under Wayne Bennett because I mean yeah. he, he is that he is going to be that notorious, isn't he? That you know Wayne Bennett's legend in rugby league will will live on for many generations, won't it? What about the France game then? You know, talk us through that World Cup walking out with your yeah. England shirt on, national anthem, go for yeah, it. Yeah, another 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 really proud moment. Um, it was just being around that environment in twenty seven in in the World Cup. Although I didn't didn't I only played in that French game, it was it was so special to be a part of. Um, we still talk about it, like you, you we still got to a grand fi- uh, final of the World Cup, although I wasn't playing in it. Yeah, I was around that environment for for the build up, and it was just so special. And then yeah, for that French game, it was it was cut really good. My parents were over for it, um, so they they travelled across and. It's just a proud moment again. Like I look back now, and I feel like you know, and I always tell people when they play for England, you know, when you do play for England, make sure you put everything into it. Like it could be your last time that you play for them, yeah. so don't leave anything on the field. And I felt like that game, I didn't really. I was, I came off it absolutely knackered. I, I just gave blood, sweat, and tears into that into that game. Just on just on that point, and I didn't ask any of the other guys this. So this this is the first time uh, I've asked this question to anybody at Abaddon. But when mm. you play for England, do you reset yourself as a rugby league player? Because, you know, it's all well and good playing well for your club. Do you have to, ele- in your mind, are you thinking, hang on, I want to taste this again. And to taste that again, I need to up my game from a yeah, club yeah. because I don't want to be missing in the next World Cup. So as a player, once you get that first taste, does it make you reset your goals in rugby league? And does it make you a better player through driving determination to get back there? Yeah, I think uh, it's... Because you, you're kind of you're playing for a different coach, aren't you? Like at that international level, so so now you're gaining someone else's trust. So you're you need to now prove to this coach that they can trust you. And next time they pick a squad, they're thinking, right, I want you in the squad because I've seen you play for international England, and I trust you. So like, I didn't play again for England until 2021. So or 2022, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, and that was under Sean Wayne. So yeah. I made a point of making sure when I played again for England, I was not going to take it for granted. I was going to make sure I left nothing on that field and didn't leave anything unturned. I was going out there and I was making sure that Wayne could trust me for the next game. And you probably, you could maybe look at some like players and think, you know, some players, uh, not some players, uh, some. Fans and that they always sometimes think, you know, why is why have people selected certain players? I'm thinking, well, they play well at international level. They're one of the best international players to be, and the coach trusts them, and they, they play the way that he wants to play. So, yeah, I think I think it is a bit of a reset. I think you do, I think you do kind of switch from club to international because it's different. It's it's a different ball game, really. It's a different. Yeah, it goes up a different level. Um, it's a different style. So, you know, I think, yeah, you do kind of have to have that bit of a mentality switch. Yeah. And, you know, we may as well stay with England until we go to Catalan. We'll wrap England up. 2022 uh, World Cup, uh, you know, uh, just over a year ago now. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier on about naivety and arrogance, and I know that you retracted the arrogance bit, but we beat Samoa uh, 60 points to six in that opening round. And let's be fair, that was probably one of the most complete. England performances we've seen in many, many, many years. To then go up against them in the semi-final and lose 27-26, it got away, didn't it? Is that the one that's got away internationally, do you think? Yeah, that's, that was that, that would hurt, that one. Um, yeah. You know, to, to, to miss out on a final, but then miss out on a home final um, in front of, you know, home crowd at Old Trafford would have been pretty special. Um no, I, 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 yeah, I don't think that was naivety. I think we knew how good Samoa were going to be. Um, 
again, I just don't think we all turned up. I don't think we all played as well as we could have done. We made unforced errors, which we didn't do in that first game against Samoa. And we, we hadn't been doing throughout that whole competition. So that one was disappointing. That was, you know, that would hurt a lot, really. Because, like I say, to be involved in a home final of a World Cup would have been pretty special. And it was there for us to take... Um, we just needed to pull it together. And we still nearly did pull it back as well, uh, which was the disappointing part. But yeah. like I say, that wasn't, that wasn't us going into it thinking we are going to win. That was us thinking you know, we need to pull a game together. And we had the game plan in place all there for us. We just didn't execute it. Uh, Chris spoke about Sean Wayne in glowing terms. He said he wished he'd have met Sean Wayne earlier in his career. It made him a better player. Yeah. What's your impressions of Sean Wayne? Yeah, probably the same. Literally, yeah. like, I think... He's, he's that good of a coach, and I knew I knew he was a good coach from people like Sam, Sam Tompkins, and Mickey McLaurin and their time at Wigan, and how much they speak highly of him. And then when I got the opportunity to be coached by him, I was like, yeah, I can see what you're saying. Now he just he's another one who gets people playing for him. He's he gets people that motivated to go out onto that field and give their absolute best and leave nothing out there. Yeah, and I think yeah, if I had a yeah, I, I wouldn't say like if I had him earlier, like because I've had some pretty good coaches and very very good coaches in in my time. But definitely someone if I could have had him as well as the others as well, I feel like I would have been a better player as well. Just because he is someone that I, I like in terms of you, you know you have a good you have a good game, but then he'll look at it and say, look, you had a good game, but we can get even better. And I had that with Pally as well. I've, I've had that with Pally in the past where he says, look, you've had a good game. As we can improve these areas and make an even better game. And you always wanted to get better. And uh, yeah, Wayne is definitely a great coach. I definitely agree with Billy on that one. Superb. Right, let's get to Catalan then. Project Catalan. Uh, mm. They'd already won a Challenge Cup by the time you got there, beating my Warrington Wolves at Wembley. We're not going to discuss that. Um, but of course, then, then you arrived with your family. I mean, first of all, um, to take your family to the south of France, because uh, it's not just you, the player that's going, you, you're taking your family yeah. as well. When the call came in, presumed by Steve, the opportunity's there for you to go to Catalan. Easy decision, tough decision. What was what was, was your thoughts at the time? Um, yeah, it was well, it was a tough time, but it was during COVID. Um, yeah. Steve had come over. He'd been staying up in Hull, I think it was, with his family. COVID and then he just said, Look, do, do you want to meet? And I said, Yeah, yeah, of course. Like this, let's have a let's have a meet. Let's have a and he didn't want to just meet me, he wanted to meet the missus as well. Meet me, the family. So he wanted to see what we'd be working with. So yeah, we just met and he sat in the garden and we just chatted really. Um chatted about rugby, chatted about life and I just got along with him. You know, the the way that he was speaking, the the, the direction of where the club was going and where he see the club, saw the club going. It was something that excited me. Um, I wanted to be... There was a time where I, well, I knew I had to leave Cass because I just felt like I needed a challenge, a new challenge, and to get out of my comfort zone. So was it an easy decision to go across to here? Probably not because there was still COVID. It was all the restrictions and... Um, you know, I, I did have a bit of interest in other clubs and I was thinking, you know, I could go there as well. Oh, are you going to tell us who thing. they were? No, I don't, I don't want to say <laughs> that, no. It was just, there'll it was few, only... There'll be a few fans interest. that have been upset then. It was only a bit of interest. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing nothing, formal in terms of a contract, but yeah, as you were saying, there was, a, there was a couple of clubs interested, but, you know, Catalan came in with their contract and, and I was, you know, I was having an hour in, but then, Mrs. was saying, look, this is what being out of your comfort zone would be. It'd be going to a country that doesn't speak English and away from what you're used to. So, completely different culture. And I just thought, yeah, you're right. So, we'll, we'll just go head over there and, and give it a crack. And one thing that stuck out, what Steve said was, you know, you could join, you know, your M62 corridor teams and, and win a Super League or you can come with come over to us and win a Super League where it's not expected, where, you know, we haven't won it before. It's not been done by a French club and we'd love to have you over there. And 
it, that was something that was exciting. Was like, you know, yeah, I want to be one of the teams that do win it for the first time. Very good. No, well, and, and absolutely right. I mean, the first Catalan Dragons team to win the grand final, like any yeah. first team to win a grand final, will go down. Will go down in yeah. folklore, won't it? Yeah, yeah. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it won't be too far off. But yeah. to get there two two times in the last three years is pretty. Yeah. That's quite. Although it's disappointing that we haven't won them, but it's it's still something special to take from it. I think. Well, it just shows that you're developing. And again, after the London game, I listened to Steve's press conference and I actually mentioned this in, in the news that I did was he's speaking he's speaking as a coach now who believes his team is at the top table. Some of the way yeah. he was talking, there is an expectation now uh, yeah. within him, probably in the camp, that Catalan Dragons aren't the bridesmaids. You know, we are, we are a force to be reckoned with and we're going to come again. Yeah, yeah I think, you know... Um... It's that, exactly that. We we want to see ourselves as being a top four side, not someone who's, you know, kind of getting into that. We want to be established top four side. We want to be competing every year. And uh, when it gets to the period of playoffs and Super League Grand Final, we want to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And and let's you play some wonderful rugby league as well over that that period. Let's let's be uh, let's be clear on that. I mean, uh, you know, I hadn't thought about this coming into the. The, the the show today, but that magic, the magic weekend. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was just what a game. I mean, I mean, I have to say, even I was punching the air at the end when Big Sam went over with that one. I mean, who'd have thought it? I mean, from your perspective, is that one of the? I mean, in your career, is that one of the better games? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think you. Well, someone was saying which drop goal was better, the one for the semi final. Gailey or semi final, that one I'd like to. It's a pretty hard call, but just the way in terms of I don't know how many minutes were left, and we were three, two or three tries down, and just to come back and get it to golden point, and how far out Jimmy Maloney was, and how well he struck it. Yeah, and I was, yeah, you know, I was fortunate enough to be right next to him, and I saw him hit it, and I was like, oh, that's gone, isn't it? That's he's hit that perfectly. And yeah, it was just it was it was pretty cool as well just to be there at Newcastle where you had all the Saints fans giving us grief all game and then suddenly we started to come back into it and then you heard the rest of the stadium just suddenly get on our side and it suddenly turned into a bit of a home game for us. And then when it hit it and it went over, the whole place was erupted. It was pretty cool. So it's a, you know, do you know what? Exactly that. Incredible. Inc- I mean, in rugby league, that's unheard of. Really, you know, three yeah. tries down with eight minutes to go. It's yeah, just, it's it kind of just... like we've done a change to a Saints, isn't it? Really, but, but even I mean, you know, Saints fans will probably throw things at the screen now. I can't remember a, a Saints game as dramatic an end like that. Um, but I can remember that one, that one's there, and it's just yeah. like, what a, what a comeback! Yeah. Incredible. And I think, I think to win the league leaders in that fashion was pretty cool, yeah, that made it even better. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, but obviously, you got to the you got to the final in, in twenty twenty one against Saints, a, a, a defeat twelve ten. Yeah. Of all the grand finals, is that the one that got away, or was it this year's against Wigan? Uh, I thought first half uh, against Wigan this year, you were the better side yeah. by some margin. I would say in that first half, yeah. the scoreboard didn't reflect it, but I felt you had the better of the game. Um, yeah. Which one of those two do you think, looking back, perhaps was a uh, missed up? Well, probably both of them, really. Yeah. Both probably got away. Um, the Saints won, yeah, it was probably pretty even. Um, just didn't really defend those key areas as well as what we should have done. Um, I think. Uh, Maguama's try in the first half that could have been stopped it was good play by him super strong and managed to finish the ball well but then the second one where he got the kick just bounced perfectly for him but I feel that we should have probably got closer to the kicker I think it was John Lomax so we should have got closer to him but yeah yeah I mean we were, we were just so close in, in both games really yeah that was probably closer than this year this year, like you say, I think we were the better side in the first half, but second half we started poorly and start poorly against 
any team in the grand final, but especially Wigan, you know, they're going to punish you and yeah. they're not going to give up, give up a try easily and we just couldn't break them down. No, no. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I was there. I thought, you know, I was sat actually with a few Catalan fans who were running around me. Mm. Great atmosphere in the yeah, ground. Yeah. I'm going to be controversial here I, 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 in, in terms of that final, possibly. I get Sam Tompkins had to play that game, 100%. Get that. I don't yeah. know if Mitchell Pearce was fully fit. Um, you'd know that. Uh, but there was a doubts over Mitchell Pearce going into the game. I get that Sam had to play, especially after that heroics of the semi-final. Yeah. But as a neutral, I was really frustrated how long it took for Arthur Morg to come on the field. I thought when when Moore came on, he put them on the back foot. One thing he's got is pace, and yeah. I just felt when he came on, it seemed to shift again in your in your direction. And of course, this year. You've got Arthur Morg at fullback, hopefully injury permitting such wood for him yeah. for the whole season. We think he's a really special player. You see him every day. How good could he become this year? Yeah, I think I think he could become not just this year, but in the future. I think he could be very, very good. Um, he's he's not got a bad uh, coach to learn from. Obviously, Sam's still around the club, so yeah. He'll be able to get advice from him whenever he wants and he can help him in his game and mentally both on and off the field um, in positioning everything. But yeah, I think in, in the future he could be extremely good. Uh, and this, He's got big shoes to fill, but he's, he's a good player and I feel like he can he can fill them. Um, like I say, he's, he's got some help with Sam around the place and he just brings... It brings that a bit of uh, electricity, doesn't it? it? Just brings that bit of French flair, really. It just it kind of it bring. It, it's good for the club to have someone come through the whole system and to be able to perform. And now he's going to get centre stage. So it'll be good for him. I think it'll be very good. Really looking forward to seeing him th this year. I have to say now, Catalan Dragons twenty twenty four version twenty twenty four. Tomkins retiring, of course. You've had a few players come and go. Um, those who watch Super League week in, week out know all about Chris Satter. They know all about Theo Farge. They know all about Abdul, which is a genius signing. Uh, yeah. Tarek Sims, because of his longevity in the game, I think everybody very aware of Tarek Sims. Uh, Bailey yeah. Sirenen, this is somebody who, whilst he has played for West, he's played for Rabbit Holes, played for the Warriors. You know, this is a guy who's played 80 plus games in, in the NRL. Uh, yeah. Brother, of course, of Curtis Sirenen. Playing in a position that you know well, second row. Um, talk to us about Bailey Seven and what's been your impressions of him since coming into the camp? Uh, extremely like, versatile. I think he can play a number of positions uh, and very well. Um, I thought in, against Warrington that first game, I feel like he'd not played or trained at nine all, all pre season and then suddenly just jumps in and just, he's just I think he's just an all round football at like rugby player. I think he, he can play any position, I think, if you put him in. Yeah. And he's got that bit of experience with, like you say, playing 80, 80 plus games in NRL, which isn't isn't an easy thing. You know, it's sometimes players don't even get anywhere near that in the NRL. So to get that many is, is good and it brings a lot of talent, I think. I think underrated talent. Some like you say, some people will be like, Oh, who's who's he or something like that. But I think since he's been here, I think he's been a really good signing and it runs runs the ball in hard and it runs some great lines and he's also got very good late footwork along with a, a passing game as well. So I think he's an all-round package. I think he's a good signing. Superb. From your perspective, I'll, I'll talk about the next one in a minute, but from your perspective, obviously, your you career very much a second rower. And I, and I, I have mm. to say, you know, the amount of... We do a team in a week on Super League, well, we have done for four years. The amount of times you've been in our team in a week is... Well, if you've got the time, go back and have a look. I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, but a hell of a lot of times, Mike, you've been in our team of the week. Uh, and of course, you know, you had a brilliant combination. When you were on that right edge, you know, the sometimes it was Dean Ware, sometimes it was Samasoni Lange Davis as well. Yeah. You know, you've got, a, I'll just say it, man, I'm not blowing smoke. You've got a good offload on you. You, you have, you, it's got to be said, you know, you can pass the ball uh, and, and open up the space for those backs to do, to do the thing. Now you're playing a bit more, again, you talk about versatility, you play multiple positions yourself, but you got the number eight shirt. You are starting to be put in the front row a little bit more last year, possibly this yeah. year as well. Is that just is that about prolonging careers? Is that just the maturity of your game? From you, how do you see that in terms of your progression from second row into prop 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it all came out really when in a couple of seasons ago, I think we were down to like a handful of, not even a handful of props. I think we had a few injuries and a couple of suspensions. So they just called me and said, look, what do you think about playing in the middle this year, this week? And I was like, eh. Because before, I was just like, nah, I'm not, I don't really want to do it. Right? But then, after, I was just thinking, you know what, yeah, if the team needs me to do it, I'll do it. Um, and, I, and I felt like I was confident, more confident in terms of a leader, in terms of I could go into that middle, start commanding it, and use my passing ability to shift the ball a bit and and use the running game that I have as well from back row as well. So I went into it and it was still raw. I was still learning how to play in the middle and was chucked in there probably a few times in, in that season and then kind of put back to back row and it kind of went like that. And then the, last year it was more in the middle rather than back row. And it just, just feels like that's the, where, where I was headed. Um not for any particular reason, but more because I've just said to Steve, I, I enjoy it more in the middle. Um, I can get my hands on the ball more. I can I get more ball. And it just gives me the, the green light to, to play a bit more of my game and passing game, running game, linking up with the halfbacks, that kind of game. So it's something I enjoy, really. Well, your second half performance, especially against Warrington when you went down to 12 men. We had you in our team of the week last week at loose forward. Uh, I think you probably shifted positions as the game went on, but because you were started, the official team sheet had you at loose, so that was good enough for us. We banged you in at loose forward last yeah. week. Uh, but yeah, second half, you talk about leadership, and I think I said that when we were talking about our team of the week. Mike McMeekin is now becoming, it looks from the outside looking in, that leadership figure, that come on lads, follow me. And and, and when your backs were against the wall against Warrington, you you, you stood up, didn't you? And and, and you did. You, you put in a second half performance that had a massive impact on your team getting over the line. Yeah, well, I just think you know we we just, when we went down to twelve men, I think we played better than when we were in yeah. thirteen men. I think you know we just we tried to do too much or we weren't doing enough or something when we were thirteen on thirteen. So. We went down to 12, we just simplified things. We were just like, just compressed the line and we'll just try and go through the middle. We'll add a bit of pass into it and then we'll do it that way. And leadership wise, yeah, I think I've learned, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to learn from some great, great leaders in the past. I think just not just, um, you know, I've had leaders in Castleford and, and at England, but obviously at Catalan, I've been lucky. I've got Sam Tompkins, Nicky. When Joel Tompkins was here, he's a great leader, and and we've got Benny Garcia as well. And he's a great leader, so we've got good leaders who I've I've picked things up from, you know. And and I I do speak a fair bit, but I, I like to also make sure that I'm leading from the front of my actions. Like I don't want to be someone who who tells someone to do it if I'm not willing to do it myself. So definitely something that I'm. Working, working on definitely. I feel like leadership is something I can work on as well. No, well, I think, like I say, you, you stood out in, in, in the second half uh, against Warrington. Uh, you really did. Uh, you could see it on the field. Final player for 2024. Not many people seen this guy coming. I didn't see this guy coming. Played predominantly in the New South Wales Cup, Queensland Cup. Saw him uh, in the warm-up game. I thought, who's this guy? Then I saw him against Warrington. I saw him again against London. Jaden Nikarima. Yeah. This could be the find of the season, I think, in terms of the imports uh, pace, mm. like you wouldn't believe. He looks a player. Go on, how good could this lad be? Yeah, I know, yeah. And the fact that he can play multiple positions as well, he can means that we can have him on the bench or we can have him starting like he's not. Yeah, it, it's, it's just um, it's a great... Great player to have starting, but then have him off the bench as well, and he can create an impact, as you saw against Warrington. Um, his speed out of the ruck is, you know, unbelievable. Like you can, it's sometimes even hard to have him on your team because he's that quick because he takes <laughs> off and you've got no chance of catching him. So, yeah, it just just brings on that energy that you need sometimes around that sixty-minute mark where you're you're looking at the the other team and they're, they're starting to get that bit of 
fatigue in their legs and bring him on and he just starts through and stuff. So I think, yeah, another good bit of business done by Steve there. Phenomenal. I mean, with him at Morg, I mean, those two on it. Yeah. We're a tiring, we're a tiring defence. Dear mm. me, you've got two two to contend with. I mean, it's it's, it's absolutely frightening. Uh, one thing's for certain, would have been right in thinking, Mike McMeek in the prop forward second row, we'd be probably happier though to be trying to catch him as a teammate mm. than having running at you as a Napoleon. Yeah, mostly because he's quite small as well, so I feel like he might be getting caught pretty high. <laughs> well, on the sideline for a few weeks. By the current rules of the game, that's perhaps give you an advantage or not, as you proved yeah, yeah. against Warrington. Yeah. As you proved yeah. against Warrington. Fantastic. I mean, in closing, before we do your, your 1 to 13, for uh, some incredible marketing uh, gone into this season. Um, you know, the game, it feels different in terms of the positivity, the marketing drive. And it'd be too easy to talk about some of the nonsense that's been going on. Hopefully, that settles down as the season yeah. goes on. But as a player, um, does it feel different this season? How big a season? I mean, last year for me was probably one of the best seasons we ever had. I mean, it went down to the wire. Three teams could have yeah. won the League Leader Shield last game. We had drop goals in semi finals, Challenge Cup finals. It was just the, it, we didn't know who was yeah. going to get relegated. We didn't know who was going to be in the play. It was just a brilliant year. We needed another one uh, as good this year uh, as we got last year. But as a player, as somebody who's absolutely in this game uh, in 2024, does it feel like this? is a big moment for the sport? It certainly feels like it's going in the right direction. Uh, the vibe from, like, at games and on social media, you see everyone's excited about a game. And especially at those those first games and how exciting they were about, you know, teams all being on television. And you, you could even argue, you know, even the right to not go to these games because they were on television. I think that's how exciting these games are in person. People want to go and watch them. They don't want to sit and watch them behind a the screen. They want to be there in person and feel the atmosphere. So it's it's definitely something that I think is going in the right direction. And as you alluded to, like last last year was one of the best years in terms of you didn't know who was going to get relegated. You had last minute winners in our semi final, and it's something that the sport needs to get on the back of. And we I think what we have got on the back of is you know this is how exciting the game is and this is only going to get even more exciting. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm a part of it and hopefully it can continue that way. Are you still young enough? You're only 29, yeah. uh, 30 this year. Big one, big yeah, one in May. I know, yeah, uh, yeah. But still, still, still plenty of time to go. You mentioned the word atmosphere there. It'd be wrong of me not to say it. How special a place is the Catalan Dragons? on yeah. those big nighttime fixtures when the flares are going off. I mean, I heard Tarek yeah. Sims talk about it after the Warrington game. Is is there anything that can match that currently in Super well, League? It's, it, it, yeah, it's special. It's it's hard to even put into words like what, how crazy it is. And Tarek's only seen that first game. So hopefully, if we can do well enough this year, we'll be able to see a semi-final when we get off that bus and they've made a tunnel for us and there's flares going off. You can't even see the right direction, but all you can hear is the, the horns going off, people clapping, cheering, everything. It's such a such a good place to play if you're at home, but it's such a hostile environment for an away team. But at the same time, I can imagine it being quite an exciting team, place for an away team to come as well, because you know, you, you, when, when do you ever see any scenes like that? It's what you see on like crazy little you know, football scenes and stuff like it's kind of like the, the, what you see in like Marseille and football teams like that. So to, to be a part of that, it's, it's, it's hard to match, really. No, it, it, it looks incredible. Uh, absolutely. Hopefully one day, Warrington have got a semi-final there and uh, I can experience yeah. it first time. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but anyway, yeah, 29, 30 this year. Plenty of leg, plenty still in your legs, Mike. Grandfather, I mean, obviously, it, from your perspective, you, it's, you want that grand final medal, don't you, before you retire? Yeah, yeah, it's certainly something that I'd, I'd like um, to be to be touching distance of it, and then three times now. But once you're in those games, it just makes you hungry to be. Even if we didn't win them, it just makes you hungry to be a part of those games. Same with same with internationals. Like they're just the games that you want to be a part of. You don't want to be part of mid-table yeah. clashes or whatever. You want to be you want to be part of the, the playoffs and. 
semi-final, final rugby. And the, like we said just then, that the atmospheres of those games are just you can't compare them to to normal fixtures. So, yeah. any decision when, when made on on next year yet, mate? I mean, I, I'm right thinking that's your last year contract. Yeah, it's the final year. Uh, not not nothing nothing uh, decided yet. It makes it a bit difficult with not being able to discuss anything until May May the first. Yeah. So, yeah, it just it, it's something I think should change in terms of we should be able to do it from NRL, similar to what they do. Yeah. Yeah. But no, nothing nothing, nothing. Uh, in stone yet. I'm sure Catalan are going to try everything to keep you though. So uh be interested to see where where you are next year. But I'd expect they'll fight to keep you. Yeah, well, it's something somewhere that we, we've we certainly love being at is um, being here. We, we, the house that we have here is, is our own, like we bought it out here. So we, we've definitely settled here. Um, but like I say, nothing's, nothing's in stone and we'll just see what happens really. Well, best of luck, best of luck. Right, we're going to do a one to thirteen, Mike McMeekin style. The first question I've got to ask you: Where are you playing? Are you playing prop? Are you playing second row? Uh, I put myself down as prop. Right. So you're. It, it made it a bit easier to pick the back rowers then. Okay, so you're number eight and you're the captain. So Mike's now going to yeah. pick his team, players that he's played with that he'd walk out with one to thirteen. So who's your full? I think I know who this is going to be. Who's your yeah. fullback? Yeah, that would be uh, Sam Tompkins. I think that was pretty simple. Yeah, yeah, incredible player. Who have you got on your wings? Uh, I've gone for uh, my roommate Tom Johnston and Denny Solomona. Yeah, yeah, Just both solid. incredibly quick and both can finish in the centimetre of space. So, yeah. you know, they're two wingers that should do anything to get on their team with. You see, Tom's last year at Cast. Is he? Is he in his last year of his contract, Tom? Um, I'm not sure. No, I thought sure. I heard on a lot of talk over Tommy Makinson potentially uh, to Catalan. Yeah. yeah, a lot of rumours yeah, over. A lot of rumours. Try not to I try not to really look on social media anymore. I'm more of a like I said, a LinkedIn or a Instagram. So Fair luckily, play. nothing comes up on my feed. We're not getting an exclusive. I like to stay, I like to stay, I like to stay away. Stay away from all that. Fair enough. No exclusive, but yeah, a lot of rumour. Uh, Tommy Makinson, potentially, for 2025 oh, in Catalan. Steve. Have a word with Steve, see how true that is. Uh, yeah, centres. Who have you got? Centres. Uh, I went with one of my best mates, uh, Greg Minikin. Right. And Michael Shenton as well. Good pro Shenton, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, good leader as well. I think, you know, the way that he can speak and everyone just stops and listens to him. Uh, like a good bloke as well. So, Head coach of the future, would you say, mate? Michael Shenton? Potentially, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think he's he's in a good spot now, isn't he? I think from speaking to Chris Sutter about him when he was at Hall FC and he, he had nothing but positive things to say about him. Um, you know, I've seen that he's gone to, to Wakefield now with Powley, so he'd be learning, learning a lot under Powley, so... I don't see why not. I think maybe that's what, if that's the direction that he wants to go in, I feel like he's a type of person that would um, would uh, kind of like excel in a situation like that and Super. learn. And he's, he's a good learner as well, so I feel like he'll, he'll want to learn from the likes of Paolo. Fabulous. Who have you got at six? Uh, six, I've got Jimmy Maloney. Okay. Uh, pretty self-explanatory, I think. You know, I had one of my, my favourite, uh, one of my best seasons when I played outside him and managed to score a fair few tries, which was unheard of for me, really. <laughs> Good season. Good, like I say, potent, potent in yeah, that second row. Yeah. You, uh, you know, you've got it about you. Uh, number seven. Uh, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> seven, I've gone for Mitchell Pierce. Just yeah. to have those two in halves would be pretty dangerous side. You had a great game yeah, against the H, think... Jed. Last year. Yeah, I don't think many Super League clubs would have been able to afford the salary cap with them too, but... No. Yeah. No, P Percy, I say HJ last year when you come to us, he had a, he had a proper game that night. He was yeah. he was on fire. Right, you're number eight, you're the captain. Who's who's your prop forward alongside you? Uh, so that's a difficult one because I've, I've got my best mate, Will Maher, or I've got Chris Hill as well. So... Uh, if I was to come off, I would bring on 
Will Maher and then uh, I'd have Hilly start him as well because you know, just what he's done in his career and on his days, one of the best props, I think. Yeah, we had Joe Philbin on. Uh, Joe Phil, yeah, yeah, we had Joe Philbin on, and uh, I asked him who was his, who had. I think one of the questions I asked him in the opening gambit, like I did with you, was who's been mm. one of his biggest influences, and he, he picked Chris. He said Chris yeah. Hill was, you know, in terms of influence in his younger days at Warrington, he said it was Chris. Yeah, yeah, I can see, I can see that because he's even for me now, like I, anything rugby, like even anything real, like I always speak to him. Uh, we always, even from me being over here and him over there, we still message and we, when we can, we meet up for a coffee when I'm over. And even for like small like advice about rugby or anything, I'll, I'll go to him some things as well, just because him being a mate and also what he's done in the game and his experience. And yeah. I feel like he's he's got what is my best interest in when I ask for uh, advice from him. Superb. Who have you got at nine? Uh, Mickey McLaurin, yes, just absolute solid and someone that you hate playing against. I know I did when I played against him, and um, you don't know how good he is until you you play with him, and how much of a leader he is until you play with him as well. Like he's another one who he talks, you listen, and but he didn't speak too much. But when he speaks, you know, it's I important thought, what he says. I thought he was really unlucky against Warrington to get that ban. Really unlucky. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, I don't know what he's supposed to do. Didn't see the intent. Um, you know, that's a whole different show, that, Mike. It really is. But yeah. as a yeah. Warrington fan, and we had it this week against All FC, no Warrington fan wants to win a game when you're no. going down to 12 men. When your opponents are down to 12 men, the whole one was a shocker. Uh, but even Mickey against us, I mean, I'm, I was watching that on the, on the telly. I couldn't go, but I thought, no, nah, that's not. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, well, especially when it's like you can understand why like, going down to 12 men if it's an actual reckless shoulders ahead, but mm. for, for like soft ones, you don't want to see teams like even when we're playing, like you, you see some players now like looking to try and get players sent off. It's like, no, it's just, that's just the way the game's yeah. gone in this first few rounds. It's like, no, like players are staying down on the floor sometimes. I'm not, like, I think. So I thought I seen someone out. Well, someone told me that uh, Ben Clary or something was getting stick. I was like, "Well, I don't, I don't think he was staying down, was he? I think he no. was trying to stay up." But then yeah. you watch it cool. back; he weren't staying down. He had a cut on his head, like he weren't exactly. Yeah. He's, I, I know Ben, and I know he wouldn't have stayed down to try and milk someone getting red carded. That's a really, you know, it's a really interesting point now that you've mentioned that. So I'm going to just ask it you straight. Yeah, yeah. We've, you're right. We have seen play acting brought in. We're yeah. seeing that. You know, yeah. Um, I don't want you to cut as a as a pro. We don't. I I don't want to see that in rugby. We're not football. No. We're not play actors. If one of your teammates behaved in that way, what would Mike yeah. McMeekin have to say in the dressing room? Don't do it again. Like it's not something that you want to see. Um, yeah. And that's what I, we I need, isn't it? To cut yeah, it out, we need. I don't like to see it. If you're injured, stay down. Like, and I think the what they're bringing in from what we've been told is there's going to be an independent doctor now at games. So they're going to watch it. And if you stay down, then off you come. So if you want to try and milk a penalty, then you can come off. But, you know, for me personally, I've always just been, even if you are injured, I always try and get up. Like, yeah. This is what I do. Like, I, don't, I don't want to see, I, d I don't want to watch it a game where someone's staying down like, I think we had a few like where you know players are staying down. It's like, no, come on, let's get up. Like the, the game's already stop start. We don't want to be stop start already. Unless you unless you are majorly injured, and then hundred yeah. percent I agree, just stay down. But yeah. if you can get up, get up. I think. Yeah, Rowan Smith's been very vocal on that. I have to agree with him. You know, if they, nobody we look after him. You, and again, yourself, Mike, you know, and I know this is how you rugby lads are, yeah, you're hard, you you're solid, you yeah. you know, it's a brutal sport to play, but you know, if Mike McMeek and it's another player. And he knows he's hurting. Mike McMeekin's the first to put the hand up to the referee, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You exactly, know what I mean? Yeah. You look yeah, after yeah. each other. You might be against each other, but you know when you've in, when somebody's injured and you're the first to raise the hand. Yeah. So, no, yeah, exactly. happy days. A whole different show, that, Mike. Second yeah, I'm row. Sure you had to fill some time with that. <laughs> second row. Who are you putting in your second row? Uh, I've gone for 
uh, Elliot Whitehead and Sam Burgess. Oof. So two pretty solid. Row. Yeah, yeah. Fortunate yeah. enough to be able to play with both of them and both incredible leaders. Um, probably Elliot Whitehead probably doesn't get as much. People don't think he's as much of a leader, but if you're in like the England environment with him, the way that he trains, the way that he's like looked up from other players, you just speak for itself, really. Mate, he's gone over to the NRL and he's put it, hasn't he? I mean, what more yeah. do you need to say? What more do you need to say? Yeah. That proves no, no, exactly. the competitor yeah. and the quality that he's got. Who have you put at 13? Yeah. Uh, Sean Lachlan. Another great leader and another great player. So I'm very, very fortunate enough to be able to play with these players, really. If you could walk out with that team, do you think you'd have a grand final medal? I'd like to think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think be, even if you had half that team, I think they'd be good enough to win a grand final. I think they'd be investigated on salary cap, but hey, they'd still well, get the medal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'd have to play, they'd have to definitely have to play under the wage that they wanted. <laughs> Outstanding. Honestly, it's been an uh, apologies if there's been a little bit of a sound issue, guys. Who on the listening, obviously, uh, we're French, 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 England uh, connection here. Uh, but look, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I say this to every player when you come on, especially players who are still playing. Yeah, I might not support your team, but it takes two teams to put on a game of rugby league. What you guys do for our entertainment, every fan in Super League is eternally grateful for. We hope you go well in 2024. Good health to you and best wishes for the season ahead, mate. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you for having me. No problem at all.